story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Have your Bibles open at Revelation and Ezekiel chapter 38. After I pray, we will discuss the battle of Armageddon and the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel and also in Revelation. Now, the reason I'm doing this, I finished the series proper. That is, I read the last verses in Revelation 22 last Friday and delivered the last message in the verse-by-verse study. Now, this week, I am giving to you the messages on the questions that were asked most in the mail. And I'm, the rest of the week, I am answering questions that came in during the series. Some people have been troubled about these things, and if you listen carefully, I believe I can help you understand. Lead us, our Father, in the name of Jesus, direct us, O God, as we study today. May thy will be done, and we'll give thee the praise. In Jesus' name we ask it. He is worthy, and it is for his sake, honor, and glory. We come, we pray, and preach. Amen. In Ezekiel chapter 38, we read of Gog and Magog. Now, I'm going to read part of that in just a few minutes. Then, in Revelation chapter 14, we read of the battle of Armageddon. Then, again, in Revelation chapter 19, we read of the of Gog and Magog gathering together a great number, that is, a group that cannot be numbered, and the only way to compare them to anything that we could understand The Bible says, as the sands of the sea, and heaven knows, no one could name the grains of sand on the seashore. Now, there are some ministers and teachers, and I'm not I'm not critical and I'm not calling any names, but there are some who teach that all of these are one and the same battle. There are others who teach that. Ezekiel and Armageddon are the same, and then they preach that Gog and Magog in the 19th chapter of Revelation is a different battle. So they preach two battles. Some preach one battle, some preach two battles, but I believe that the evidence is clear. And I believe the scripture points out beyond any shadow of doubt that there must be three battles. There must be, and I'll tell you why. In Ezekiel 38, we read that the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel and said, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach, Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth, and all thy, thine army, horses, horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And then he names Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and so on, Gomer, and all of these in the north quarters, north quarters, and all his bands, and many people. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company, that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Now he's talking to Ezekiel. After many days, after many days. Now this was not to occur in the days of Ezekiel, as it was in the days of Daniel. He did not understand what he had penned down in the book, that bears his name, God gave him the message, and he he did not understand, but God said, rest, seal the book, seal it up, and rest until the time of the end. Now, Ezekiel is informed that after many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but 
it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like unto a cloud to cover the land, thou, and all thy bands may be with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into the mind, thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. Now, he's speaking here of the leader of the army of God, that is the army, Gog and Magog. Gog is the leader, Magog is the land. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Now, that's the nation Israel. And today, they do not have any walls. Now, the old city, the old city has a wall. But the nation Israel has no walls. There are no walls around the villages. I have been there. I've seen it. And I know of I know what I'm talking about. I haven't been there in recent years, but even back when I was there, there were no walls, and the desert was beginning to blossom as a rose. Now, the evil thought to take a spoil, to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited, and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations, which have gotten cattle and goods, and dwell in the midst of the land, as Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, with all the young lions thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver, gold, take cattle, and goods, and take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people Israel dwell safely, shalt thou not know it. And then, of course, he goes on down and explains how this will occur. Now, beloved, there is not one thing in common between Gog and Magog here and Gog and Magog in Revelation number chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. Now listen. In Revelation 19 and verse 7, when the thousand years are expired. Now that is definitely, definitely pointing out beyond any shadow of doubt, anyone who wants to see it, the Holy Spirit is pointing out here that this will occur at the climax of the 1,000 years of peace on earth, the millennium, the time that there will be peace on earth and men will beat their swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks. The 1,000 years, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. There's not one word about Satan being loosed out of his prison in Ezekiel. And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters. In Ezekiel, it's the northern nations that come down. The northern. But this is the whole wide world. Now, you see, it doesn't all in the world you need to do, beloved. All in this world you need to do is read the Bible and leave what man has to say out of it. Well, Brother Green, aren't you saying something? I'm simply asking you to compare Ezekiel 38 with Revelation 19, 7 and following. In Ezekiel, the nations are numbered that make up the northern armies. Here, the, the devil goes to the four quarters of the earth. That means the whole wide world. In Ezekiel 38, the northern nations, here all nations, Gog, Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sands of the sea. Now, that is, that is just, well, in other words, the Holy Spirit, only the Holy Spirit, only God could or would use a comparison like that. Can you imagine a man for every grain of sand on the beach, all the beaches, around the seas, or even the Mediterranean for that matter, if you want to narrow it down to the Mediterranean, can you imagine a soldier for every grain of sand? And they went up on the breadth of the earth to compass the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Here, here there is no battle, here 
They gather to battle, but there is no battle because God burns them to ashes. Of course, the bodies, the spirits, will go into the pits of the damned, but here it is fire that burns the enemy and cremates the enemy and burns them to ashes. And in Ezekiel, they fight a battle, and of course, it takes seven months to bury the dead. So you can see, if you want to see, that there is nothing in common between the two battles. They are not similar in any way at all, except name, Gog and Magog. Now, why the Holy Spirit uses Gog and Magog here, I can't answer that. That's one of the things that I'll ask the Lord if we ask questions when we get there, and it won't make any difference in anyhow. Now then, the next thing that I'd like to point out is the battle. Oh, by the way, you say, Brother Green, when do you think the battle in Ezekiel will be fought? Now, there is no definite pinpointed time. Now, in Revelation 19, that battle, there'll be no battle, but that uh, affair will take place at the end of the millennium. Now, Satan will be loosed a little season. So, a little season after the millennium, This will occur that you read in uh, Revelation 19. Now, in Ezekiel, of course, uh, we find that that will occur. I rather we find no definite date when it will occur. But I believe, I believe personally that it will occur sometime during the tribulation. And I would believe sometime beyond the middle part. That is, it will occur during the last three and a half years, probably near the end of the tribulation. Probably near the end. But there is no date, there is no suggestion that it will take place at the middle or the middle of the last half or the last days of the last half. There is a definite fact that there will be a battle that is definitely stated, but the time is not pinpointed, therefore it is not important. Now, in the, the, in the case of the Battle of Armageddon, now that other, that other battle in Gog will happen sometime uh, during the, I believe, during the last half of the tribulation period. Now, the Battle of Armageddon will happen at the very end of the tribulation. And we find here that uh, John said, I looked and behold a white cloud and him that sat on the cloud. And then he goes on down and he talks about the angel with the sickle and he came out of the temple and another angel came out from the altar and he had power over over fire and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle saying, Thrust in thy sickle, sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and behold, blood came out of the winepress, even of the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand six hundred furloins, which is approximately two hundred miles, and the valley there is about ten miles wide. So you have a lake, a lake of blood, ten miles wide, two hundred miles long, six feet deep. Now, if you can imagine that, uh, just let your mind run wild and try to imagine a lake of blood that large. Now, this battle will be fought at the end, the very end of the tribulation. Now, let me state this. I said, I do not believe the battle of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel will be fought in the first half of the tribulation. I believe Ezekiel 38 will take place sometime during the last half of the tribulation. Maybe about the middle of it. I don't know the exact time. The Bible doesn't tell us. But maybe about the middle of the last half of the tribulation. And then when the tribulation is over, the, we'll have the battle of Armageddon when the, 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 uh, the armies of, Israel, uh, of, uh, of uh, Russia and others will gather around Israel and attempt to annihilate the people of God, but they will be annihilated and the blood will run to the horse's bridles. Now back in uh, Ezekiel we read of a certain percentage of the army being destroyed, but here the entire army is destroyed in Armageddon. Now in Gog- in the 19th chapter, and I'm trying to put too much in one broadcast, I know that, but I must, and I hope you'll jot down uh, the main points and study them further when I leave the radio. Now in the last part, 
The battle is definitely pinpointed because Satan is loosed a little season after the 1,000 years and then he goes to the ends of the earth, the four quarters, north, east, south, west. And he goes all over the earth and he puts to the test those who were born during the millennium who had never been tempted and those who yield will make up the armies of Gog in Revelation 19 and they will gather around Jerusalem with the desire and the intent of destroying Jerusalem but fire will come down from God out of heaven and burn them up. And so that is the end of that. In Ezekiel, we find burying the dead. In Revelation, no burying of the dead. In Armageddon, we simply read that the birds will eat. The fowls of the air will devour the flesh of kings and so on. But there is no flesh to devour in Revelation 19. The flesh is burned. So you see, beloved, if you just read the Bible and compare the scriptures and let them fall in place as the Holy Spirit gives to you the ability to read and compare and look at the scripture, then you'll see clearly that according to the description of these battles, there must be three. Ezekiel 38, it will happen sometime during the last half of the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 14, Armageddon, that will happen at the end of the tribulation. And then Revelation 19, that will happen at the end of the millennium. Not the end of the tribulation, but the end of the millennium. Armageddon, the end of the tribulation. Ezekiel 38, sometime during the last half of the tribulation period. Now, to me, that is crystal clear. I have no trouble, I don't fully understand it all, but I have no trouble seeing that this is the only reasonable and the only acceptable interpretation of these three passages of Scripture. But let me say this. It doesn't make too much difference to me anyhow uh, because I won't be here. And I'm sorry that people will suffer and I'm sorry that people will die and I'm sorry that unnumbered multitudes will pour into hell like water is now pouring over the Niagara Falls. I'm sorry about that. But I don't worry. I will not be here. And if you're born again, you will not be here. And if you're not born again, glory to God, you can be. Right now in the next 60 seconds, you can be born born again if you want to be born again. What must I do, Brother Green? What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your trust in His finished work, in His shed blood. Let Jesus come into your heart. Let Him wash your sins away and praise God. You'll be in that number when the saints go marching in. Now, how do I believe? Well, the Bible tells us how shall we believe until we hear. How shall we hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, God sent me to preach and I'm preaching the gospel and you're listening to the gospel and if you'll hear this verse and believe it you'll be saved that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved you believe that do you believe that God sent Jesus do you believe he died on the cross do you believe that God raised him up from the dead do you believe that then shut your eyes and talk to Jesus and just say dear Jesus I do believe it and I do want you to save me And I do confess my sins and I call on thy name to forgive my sins and wash them away in your blood and write my name in the Lamb's book of life and give me peace instead of fear and worry. Give me joy instead of sorrow and horror. And he will. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he'll save you now. Dear Heavenly Father, there are many listening today who are not prepared to meet God. And I pray, O Father, in the name of Jesus, and for Jesus' sake, honor and glory. I beseech thee, O God, save every soul that's under conviction, especially that soul that will never hear another gospel message. We ask it in Jesus' name, for his sake he's worthy. Amen.